Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining our webinar, SNAP Elections, Rules and Advocacy. This webinar is brought to you by the Ontario Nonprofit Network. My name is Melanie, and I am the Communications and Network Engagement Manager here at ONN. If you're new to ONN, welcome. We are the provincial network for Ontario's 58,000 nonprofits and charities. We're focused on policy, advocacy, and services to strengthen Ontario's nonprofit sector as a key pillar of our society and our economy. If you're already a member of ONN, welcome back and thank you for your support. Our public policy research and advocacy work would not be possible without you. We do have some housekeeping notes to go over today. So while I share those, I'm gonna also share a poll about what you're most interested in learning today. So we'd love to know what you're interested in learning about during today's webinar. Is it about how Bill 254 may impact your nonprofit and sector? Are you interested in learning campaign rules and key components for success in election related campaigns? Are you interested in learning more about what SNAP elections are and how they may be triggered? Or are you looking forward to learning what registration and reporting requirements apply to nonprofits? And while you're filling that out, I'll just go over a couple of housekeeping notes about um, if you have any technical difficulties. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, such as a visual lag, we recommend closing your web browser and reopening it. If you still experience any problems, you can also type the issue into the question box and our tech team will respond as soon as possible. Although we don't have a traditional chat box in this platform, we encourage you to ask questions and share comments through the Q&A box. Our team is monitoring it and we'll make sure to share the feedback with our speakers today. You are also more than welcome to share your comments and learnings on social media with the hashtag election rules. We will answer as many questions as possible during our question and answer session, which will be at the end of the webinar. And to answer your most common question, you will receive an email with the recording um, within one week of today's webinar. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna close the poll and share the results. It's great to see that there's a wide range of interest. A lot of people are interested in Build 254 and it seems like everyone um, is also interested in campaign rules and what registration and reporting requirements may apply. So thank you so much for filling that out. To start today's conversation, I would like to acknowledge the land that we are working and living on. So here at ONN, we are working on the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. This territory is part of the Dish with One Spoon, Wampum Belt, and the Upper Canada Treaties. I'm also joining you from the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. At ONN, we believe that as nonprofits, we must take our role seriously um, in responding to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action. As settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to live and work on this territory. And as individuals, we all have an obligation to learn from Indigenous communities about collective ownership and sustainable economic and environmental systems that are respectful of the land and water which we all depend on. Joining me today, um, we have our two speakers, Sapriya Divendi and Kyle Morrow. But before I, um, I introduce our speakers, I would like to introduce my colleague, Liz Sutherland, the Director of Public Policy at ONN, who's going to provide us with a quick update regarding Bill 254 and how it may, up, how it may impact your uh, election campaigns. Over to Thank you, so Liz. Much. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Good, good, good. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Um, thanks for letting me crash your party. I'm really pleased to be here with you folks. Um, this was a little um, uh, public service announcement that we added on to our webinar plan once uh, Bill 254 
uh, got through the legislature really fast and received royal assent this week. Uh, so we just wanted to give you kind of highlights of, of what the changes are, uh, but we will be doing a guidance and a checklist for nonprofits so you know uh, what's going on. Um, so I, I won't take up too much time and just a caveat that this is our preliminary understanding of the bill and we will have to get some uh, legal eyes on it to make sure that we're giving out the right advice, uh, but just some highlights about what we're seeing in the bill that uh, nonprofits should be aware of right now if they're looking to engage in uh, provincial advocacy. So um, I've got four quick slides, so I'll go through them fairly quickly and then hand things over to the, the other speakers today uh, who we're delighted to have. So first of all, um, this is about um, third party spenders uh, or third parties in, in political campaigns. And so that means it's about um, any organization that's not a political party or a politician or a candidate for office that spends money um, doing advocacy work. So um, not just having a website, but actually buying you know, time on a billboard or a Facebook ad and that kind of thing. So it's about spending money. Um, and already we had rules in place that meant if you had spent uh, $500 over a six month period in the lead up to an election in Ontario, uh, that you had to register and you had to track and report that separately. So um, those rules have now been extended to 12 months, which means that um, if we do the math from counting back from the provincial election uh, fixed date in June 2022, uh, that means we're talking about May of this year when the new rules go into effect, which is why we're talking about it now. Um, so I mentioned this is about issue-based advertising. So it's, um, it's about the issue that uh, any issue that can be reasonably associated with a position that a party or a candidate takes a position on, uh, that is what might get caught up. So it's not just about you know saying something positive or negative about a party, but actually taking a position on something that a party takes a position on. So if it's climate change and climate change becomes um, uh, an election issue, then that unfortunately can get swept up in these rules. Um, so yeah, just a reminder that uh, if, if you do um, fall under these rules, it means accepting only, only eligible donations, uh, and there's rules about that, having a separate bank account, uh, tracking donors separately, appointing a chief financial officer, and filing a board resolution so that um, all of that is on file with uh, Elections Ontario. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. To my uh, silent ONN partner in the background. Um, so the second slide is about charities, and these rules were in place from 2016. There are additional rules for registered charities. You're prohibited from donating to third-party campaigns, and that means that any advertising you do has to be done in-house. Uh, nonprofits or charities that want to partner with you, um, they, uh, they can't accept donations from charities, so you have to be mindful of that, even if you're not a charity. And there are no, obviously no partisan activities allowed for charities, and most charities know that. For nonprofits, if you're not a registered charity, that's a choice. Next slide, please. So what's new with Bill 254? I said that the rules now apply to a 12 month period before the election. So we have to be thinking about this from May 5th onward. Um, and as I say, we'll put out some guidance before that to make sure that we start to spread the word. And we've encouraged Elections Ontario to do some um, uh, education with the nonprofit sector as well. Uh, you have to report according to rules that the standing committee uh, put into the, the bill over the course of the legislative process. You have to report every time you spend $1,000 on paid advertising now, not just on the, the total amount. Um, and watch that maximum spending limit if you engage in collaborative advocacy. I don't think this pertains to our audience, but if you hit an upper threshold, which is uh, quite large, um, then um, you need to be mindful that there are rules around collaborative advocacy. And the last piece is that both donors and recipients have to report the donation if you're doing that work. Last slide, please, for me, and then I'll hand things over. Um, Thank you. So the the um, this webinar is about snap elections, and really, when it comes to the Ontario rules, uh, there's not a great deal of difference because they've made that pre-election period so long that pretty much any time we could have a snap election from this point on means that we're already within that 12-month window uh, where the spending limits apply. So I've put on this slide, which I'm not going to go over because you'll get the slides after and you should have them on reference. These are the rules around how much you can spend in a fixed date or a snap election. So those will go out to you to have a look at. 
Uh, but all of that said, um, I want to leave you with the message that the time is now to influence political party platforms. Uh, the, the platforms are going to be developed probably over the summer and into the fall. So if you want to get your uh, advocacy pieces into what the parties are saying as they gear up for the election, then now is the time to be thinking about what that ask is. Um, and don't forget that nonprofit advocacy that doesn't involve paid advertising, so your the ordinary advocacy work that you do uh, year round, um, year in and year out, um, is fair game. And so uh, please continue to advocate because it's critical that nonprofits continue to bring the voices of communities to government and uh, parties that, uh, that want to be the government. So with that, that's the end of my public service announcement on Bill 254, and I'll hand things over to our other speakers to take you through the rest of the program. Um, and as I say, slides will go out um, so you have those details at hand. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, I'm really excited to welcome our first speaker today, Sapriya, Senior Counsel for Enterprise Canada, a national strategic communications firm. She's a former talk radio host, a campaign advisor, and she's also a natural, a natural and effective communicator who has extensive expertise in strategic and crisis communications media strategy, and building stakeholder relationships. Her background as a journalist, coupled with her um, widespread campaign experience, means she knows how to craft a narrative that will break through the noise and win over audiences. In addition to being a weekly panelist on CPC's Power and Politics, Sapriya has made a name for herself as a sought after political analyst and media commentator for both national and international outlets alike. We are so lucky to have her speaking with us today. Um, so over to you and thank you so much for dedicating your time today. Oh, thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, so I, we can get my face out of there. We can go to the next slide, I think. Let's just jump right into it about, uh, let me state the very obvious fact that campaigning this year uh, will be very different. We're obviously in a pandemic. Um, so that means, you know, we're gonna have to go digital first. We're going to have to recognize the fact that everybody is sort of stretched thin right now. You know, everyone's kind of hitting that so-called COVID wall and it means their attention is also stretched. And then on top of that, as if things weren't, you know, dicey enough already, we are in a minority parliament situation. So we're not dealing with, uh, uh, you know, a situation where we know when the next election will be. Um, I think we can relax a little bit for the immediacy of any potential election, but of course, in a minority parliament situation, anytime uh, basically either the government or the opposition decides that they you know, no longer want the status quo, we are going into an election. Next slide, please. Um, but the good news is, if you've done a campaign before, the core basic rules of campaigning 101 still very much apply, right? You need effective communication. So what does that mean? You need basically one or two key messages. Um, you don't need to, you know, reinvent the wheel, or and nor, nor do you want to, you know, inundate any potential supporters of the campaign with a bunch of different messages. You just need to pick one or two and target them. You to the audience that you think already cares and the people that could potentially care. And you wanna do so in normal human language. Uh, don't sound like a robot and you need to make that emotional connection. A really good example of this is that whenever you hear uh, politicians talk about the deficit, they never talk about it in terms of like sheer numbers, right? They're often talking about it as something that our, our kids, our grandkids, our future generations are going to have to deal with. Um, Liz had mentioned climate change as, as being you know, a potential issue that's going to come up. Climate change is another similar example. If you're trying to get people to care about the issue, you, know, you can talk about the earth warming in terms of a matter of degrees or ocean acidification or whatever it may be, but you have to ultimately tie it back to how it will impact people and how it will affect them and the people that they care and love. So facts are great, don't get me wrong. You always need facts in there, um, but you need to tie it back to that emotional connection. Yeah. Now, um, earned media versus paid media. I'm gonna start with earned media and then we'll move on to paid media, but I, I really do wanna stress that when you're talking about earned media, you know, you're talking about um, you putting a message out there and media taking you up on that message. And what that involves is a pitch. 
And so often as a journalist, I would receive pitches or press releases where I would read them and just go, huh? Like, what is this even trying to say? Or I'd stop reading because quite frankly, the press release was too long. So a bit of press release 101 here. Um, it shouldn't, your press release should almost never be longer than a page. It can in some cases be two pages, but that's only really if it's a very complex or technical issue that you need to uh, further put facts on, on the second page to support the initial release. You will have in any given press release, basically you know, four paragraphs. In the first paragraph, is your TLDR version, the too long didn't read version of why the heck you're reaching out to folks to begin with. It's the important points that you want to make. Why does this matter and what is the angle? Those are the two main things, particularly if you're sending this to a, for a, a journalist um, in order to cover the story. Then you're gonna wanna get down into some of the more nitty gritty details. So this is where you would put in any supporting facts or statistics uh, in order to hook in um, the potential journalist here. And then the third paragraph, you're going to want to have the so-called human element. This is where you'll often have a quote in there from a spokesperson or perhaps, you know, the CEO of the organization. And you want to make sure that that quote uh, is sort of jumps out at people, but also that it's polished and ready to go so that journalists can include that quote into any copy that they will uh, end up writing. And then lastly, you know, you have the sort of wrap up uh, paragraph. That's when you would offer up somebody for an interview. Um, and then the, the very last thing is you put like about organization XYZ. And that's really when you would, um, you know, that's where you could boast about yourself and uh, put in a few more facts about the organization um, itself. Now, when it comes to who to reach out to, this is really important because often, uh, and again, when I would receive press releases back when I was a journalist, um, I don't actually, as a radio host, when I was a radio host, control much of the content. You know, there is a degree where hosts will have input and of course, you know, they drive the discussion. However, producers are who you really wanna get into the good graces of. Likewise, um, if you're talking about print, you wanna go to assignment editors. Newsrooms will often have a general tips or uh, general inquiry uh, email address or line. You would also want to include any releases into that because then you're, you're ensuring a broad audience. But you don't want to necessarily just put all your eggs into one basket. You want to make sure that you're reaching out to a, a, a broad base uh, of folks. Um, and the other thing I wanted to touch on is that uh, there are differences between the various uh, platforms that are out there. So for example, talk radio, um, while it's still radio and CBC is still radio, you know, they, they differ actually quite a bit in terms of the kinds of content that they would cover, the kinds of stories that they would be interested in, and just like the logistics of how they would operate as uh, an organization. You know, talk radio, uh, the drive programs, meaning the morning drive or the afternoon drive shows often will only have one producer, whereas, you know, a show like uh, Metro Morning here on, on, on CBC Radio One has something like over 10 producers that are able to sort of um, partner with one another. So that, that affects, you know, attention span, that affects you know, the kinds of things that they will end up covering. And it's worth keeping that in, in mind. Um, it, it's also worth keeping in mind that particularly with uh, talk radio, they're always in search of content. Now, that means that they will want to look for something new. They're going to want to cover a story that they think has an angle, that emotional angle that I was talking about. Um, but that also means that they don't generally tend to do very complex or technical stories or issues. Um, those are often best left for on broadcast, either on the television side, where they can put up, you know, infographics that can help explain the issue, um, or on on CBC Radio, like like I was talking about, just because they have the extra bandwidth to producers to be able to, you know, write out scripts uh, for the hosts. Um, I think I touched a little bit on on the differences between various outlets, and I was using radio as an example. So I'll just lastly say this. I mean, I think everyone in this audience would recognize that there's a pretty big difference between the Globe and Mail, the Star, the Toronto Star, and the Toronto Sun. 
Um, you wouldn't want your pitch to look exactly the same for every one of those publications because you would want to you know, tailor it and hook it to um, what they would be interested in covering. Now, paid media is uh, pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's a media that you more or less pay for. Um, so this means you know, sponsored social media posts, uh, ads, display ads, uh, SEO, so paid search results, uh, anything that, you know, video ads that pop up. Um, and these are all aspects that are going to feature heavily in a digital campaign environment because you, know, you can't rely on the old school method of, or traditional method, I should say, of door knocking and you know streeters and, and talking to folks. Everything now is going to have to shift to digital in a COVID-19 environment. Good news is, however, in, in this you know, digital first environment is that we're all spending way more time on digital than we were in the past. In fact, digital time has now surpassed for the average Canadian than the time that they spend watching television. So that's the good news here. And it's ubiquitous. You know, people tend to tie digital, you know, necessarily with a younger generation, but you know, nine in 10 Canadians are using the internet daily. That's across all age demographics, all socioeconomic de demographics. About half of Canadians no longer watch TV regularly or, or would consider themselves light viewers. And every one in five minutes on mobile is actually spent on either Facebook or Instagram. So we're all basically addicted to the internet and that works out to our advantage from a campaign perspective. Now, I've touched on this before, but COVID really has changed our daily routines. I talked a little bit about those drive shows on talk radio, right? The morning drive and the afternoon drive. Those ratings have plummeted because you know very few people are commuting every day to work. So it's impacting how we consume media. It also factors into what we're paying attention to. As I said, we've all sort of hit that wall. We're all stretched in. You know, we're we're working from home, living at work, however you want to qualify it. But that means we may not have the you know the bandwidth that we once did in a traditional campaign environment. Yeah, you can go to the next slide there. So digital, what does that mean? We're talking social media, we're talking online advertising, we're talking your organization's website, and we're talking um, direct email campaigns. This is my number one rule for social media. Not all social media is the same. And I think most people recognize that, but it's very important not to treat all platforms in the same manner. You don't, the last thing you want to do is lazily copy and paste posts that you would put on, you know, Twitter to Facebook or to Instagram because they all have very different audiences and functions. And here are some of that. Um, Facebook, for example, uh, tends to feature a much broader audience. Um, it does tend to skew a little bit older. Uh, it allows for, you know, engagement as well in, in their comment section. So you can, you know, start to drum up a, a, a lot of uh, support or buzz uh, on that front. Instagram is, uh, you know, photo primarily. It's, it's where memes are, are, are born for the most part. Uh, it's also heavily uh, involved in influencer marketing and campaigns. And with the advent of uh, Instagram Live, you know, you can live stream things right away to an audience that would be engaged. You also have stories, which are a great function. Um, millennials uh, tend to rely quite heavily on Instagram. Twitter is very good for your insiders, your politicos, your decision makers, but it doesn't really reach a broader segment of the population. I mean, I used to joke uh, quite regularly on my radio show that, that Twitter, um, you know, normal people aren't necessarily on there or are following the discourse. It's basically people just yelling at like-minded people for, for the most part. Um, Google and YouTube, you know, most people will obviously be quite familiar with. It's a, uh, you know, it's a video sharing platform. It has a rather competitive return on your investment 
for the uh, high quality um, videos that could then um, build up a, a user base. Uh, LinkedIn, I think, is often a platform that is overlooked or underutilized. Um, if you're looking to reach a, a business-oriented or business-minded audience, that is where you would want to primarily post. Online advertising, um, I think what, you know, we've all sort of had that moment where we were talking about something and then before we know it, our Facebook or Instagram ads are exactly what we were talking about. Um, I, I think that's worth noting that, you know, these, these social media platforms are very good at being able to target um, who your audience should be. They have a, an inventory that marketers can access to be able to deliver promotional messages. It's, it's uh, very user friendly, even if you're scared of tech or don't have a lot of experience, they do all the legwork um, and heavy lifting for you. The major advertising platforms, of course, would be Facebook, Google, and, and Twitter. And if any one of you are regular social media users, you will note that political parties are basically running ads 24-7, uh, not only to acquire new supporters, but often um, in conjunction to be able to raise funds. Now, your website really is your HQ. It's your home base. It is your home on the internet. This is where it should be, um, you know, to obviously have your bio, your web pages, any sort of sign up forms. It's where you're going to house your, your, your databases. Um, it's also the best place to initially hook somebody into your campaign and then get them to sign up so that you then have their contact information. Email. It's been around forever because it works. Um, it's the only real way to be able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with supporters, with like-minded individuals in order to garner a lot of valuable insights about what they value and what they don't, what they do not. And, you know, I mentioned social media and political parties. It's also worth noting that, you know, to this day, um, even in this environment with social media being ubiquitous, um, political parties will still rely on email quite heavily to generate um, campaign revenue, anywhere between 40 and 70 percent. And I would expect that to actually increase in a COVID environment. Um, I don't want to sound too much like a Debbie Downer here, but there are things you need to keep in mind during a digital campaign. I think folks need to be realistic about their online presence and where they would best be uh, utilizing a campaign. So for example, if you do, if you are looking to reach a, um, you know, a, a highly insider base, that's where you would want to focus on Twitter. But if you only have three followers on Twitter, but your Facebook page has over 2000 uh, supporters, then you might want to rethink what that strategy could be. Um, and again, I'm going to focus on this. Do not shy away from the emotional argument. You always want your, your argument to be backed up by facts, but ultimately you have to make any good campaign about why someone should care. And the only real way to do that is to appeal to somebody's emotions. Now, building a winning campaign, what does that look like? So you've got, you're gonna get a mix of a little bit of everything. You're gonna want um, uh, online ads, you're gonna have a tight website, you're gonna want um, to develop a good branding and good narrative, you're gonna wanna use email like I talked about, but then the traditional elements are still gonna be there. You're still gonna need your research, you're still gonna need your GoTV or your get out the vote, and you're still gonna ultimately need your ground support to a degree. Now, I say ground support, it will likely look like, I mean, I would consider this a little bit of ground support, but we're doing it in a virtual manner. So the debates, events, uh, and canvassing that you would normally do door to door in a traditional environment, that just shifts slightly digital, but, but the core elements are all still there. And this is this is actually really important. I think um, one of the best advents of you know campaigning in an internet savvy environment is that you can be nimble. Um, traditional campaigns that used to rely quite heavily on old school legacy media would basically force you to adopt a, a generic messaging 
um, and then you're just like carpet bombing essentially, excuse me for using a crass term, but you're you're putting out generic messaging that isn't actually gonna you know, resonate with everyone who's going to be receiving that message. With digital, um, you can actually run, if you have the capacity to, multiple messages at the same time across different uh, platforms on a variety of issues, and then you're able to pinpoint exactly what each person would then care about and focus your campaign in that manner. How do you build and nurture a winning coalition? The best way to do this, in my experience, is if you're getting people to sign up for an issue, you're having ads that are targeted, that are issue specific, and you know who is engaging with those ads, they're telling you already what they care about. You don't have to poll, you don't have to door knock, you know, there's no expensive um, you know, robocalling or, or call centers that are needed. If you're asking people to self-identify already with an issue specific campaign, they're much more likely and much more inclined to actually give up their contact info, which can then be used for new opportunities, uh, particularly on the fundraising side. So the little circle of campaign winning I'd like to call is that you're introducing an issue, you know, factually, you're illustrating that the importance with respect to that emotional argument, you're updating on any key information that you uh, need to update on, and that's this whole be nimble thing. Um, you're going to want to also be prepared um, in in this uh, polarized, politically polarized environment to be able to um, come up with a few counter attacks. You have to expect um, in this environment that there will be, you know, folks out there that are going to be throwing. Uh, back some attacks or throwing some punches with respect to policies that you're putting out there. And then you're, you want to give people a concrete action to take. So what are you asking them to do? Are you asking them to sign up? Are you asking them to, you know, talk to three other people about the issue? But you want to have a specific ask in there for them. And this is the best part about um, you know, a, a, a digital campaign, is that you actually only need to get out the vote for the people that you need to. Um, you, because you're doing a digital first, we're gonna be in a digital first environment, we're gonna already have a pretty good sense of who your uh, supporters are, who you would want to get to you know, the polls, who you would want in order to um, you know, call their, their local MPP or MP on an issue, you don't need to go around mobilizing, you know, hundreds or dozens of, of volunteers for car rides on E-Day or anything like that. You just need one ad campaign targeted at your core supporters, reminding them to get out there. And with digital, you can actually very precisely define how many times you want an individual to be able to see um, that specific message to get out the vote. So it, it can be daunting, definitely, um, but all of this ultimately ends up working to a campaign's advantage. And then lastly, you know, this is something that I've sort of been touching on throughout, but I, I really just uh, do want to stress that um, people really have hit a wall where there's no point in denying that we're in incredibly trying times. It matters now how we're connecting with people and it, it matters to be able to find new ways uh, to do so. Um, I, I think the natural progression of things was going to eventually be this point, right, where we're, we are focusing on digital a little bit more than some of the more traditional aspects of campaigning. Uh, and COVID-19 has just sort of accelerated all of that. Um, in, in 2021, even without COVID though, you cannot win a campaign without a strong digital presence. Um, you have to be visible online. You have to be part of the, you know, the, the online discourse and you're gonna want to insert yourself into important conversations and to be able to shape that conversation before folks who disagree with you are the ones shaping it. And that's it for me. Um, my contact info there, if anybody ever wants to uh, reach out and get in touch on how to build a winning campaign. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to share that. Uh, I loved being able to see the specific components and tangible tips and strategies that we can all implement.
um, in our nonprofit. So thank you for your time again. And now I would love to introduce our second speaker, Kyle Moreau. Um, Kyle is a lawyer at Baskin Law, and he's been a great supporter of ONN and has shared his expertise with us in the past as well. His practice is primarily focused on political law. Kyle routinely advises clients on their compliance obligations at the municipal, provincial, and federal levels of government in the areas of lobbying, conflicts of interest, campaign finance, anti-bribery and corruption, and whistleblowing. He's also a current member of the Ontario Bar Association's Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Committee. And in his spare time, Kyle enjoys reading on public policy and politics. He's volunteered on election campaigns in British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, Nova Scotia. And so needless to say, he is a wealth of information. I mean, we are very excited to have him here today. Over to you, Kyle. Okay, thank you, Melanie, and it's a it's a pleasure to be with you today. I always love speaking at the uh, at the ONN, and if there's any way that we can help out, uh, please please contact us after. First thing I want to just say though on the next slide there is that um, uh, the Elections Act is very complex, and if you are considering engaging in regulated activities or you want to remain unregulated, it's really important that you speak to a lawyer and you get an individual legal opinion. Um, the act is changing, the rules are complex, and we don't want anyone on the webinar today to get into trouble. <clears throat> so switching over to the next slide, um, I just want to give you a brief overview of where we're going to go uh, in, the, in the legal portion of the presentation. So the first thing I'm going to talk about on this slide is just what is a fixed election versus a non-fixed election, how can it be triggered, how likely is it, those sorts of things. I then want to shift into uh, the three regulated categories. There are three regulated categories under the Elections Act for third parties, election surveys, election advertising, and partisan activities. So we'll walk through each one of those, what specifically is covered and what's not covered. We'll also talk specifically about social media. And social media is a uh, very complex area when it comes to the federal election rules. So I'll walk you through some examples and show you how you can do things that are remain unregulated and what sorts of things would be regulated on social media. Um, after that, I'll walk you briefly through the registration and reporting requirements. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about enforcement and some of the uh, legal risks that are associated with uh, non-compliance. So the first thing I want to just point out is that we do have a fixed election date law in Canada. Um, the next fixed date election is scheduled for October 16th of 2023. However, most of us that follow politics do not think that this minority parliament will survive until 2023. I think most people think we're either headed towards a spring election, a summer election, or potentially a fall election. And you'll just notice on the screen there, the average minority parliament in Canada survives uh, 605 days. <clears throat> Switching to the next slide. So we'll, we'll jump right into the three categories of regulated activities now. So the first one will be election surveys. Oops, sorry, I jumped ahead a few things here. That's okay, we can go back. Let's go forward one slide here. Uh, first of all, just uh, before we jump into the election surveys, I'll just say, what is a third party? Um, and a third party is essentially any group, individual, corporation, uh, with the exclusion of a federal party or a federal candidate um, that seeks to influence an election. So the term is defined very broadly. So anyone on the call who engages in a regulated activity, uh, their organization would be considered a third party. There is no exemption for non-for-profits and there is no exemption for charities um, uh, from these requirements. Um, this was explained a little bit when we were talking about the bill that's uh, in the Ontario legislature right now at the provincial level. Generally, there's two regulated periods. Uh, there's a pre-election period and an election period at the federal level. However, the two regulated periods only apply to fixed date elections. So if this parliament survives until 2023, in May of 2023, we will start the pre-election period. However, if the parliament falls, um, any time before May of 2023, this fall, for example, uh, there will only be one regulated period. 
I'm just switching over to the next slide, that regulated period will start the day the election is called. So if an election is called on May 20th, for example, of this year, there won't be a pre-election period because it's a snap election, it's not a fixed date election, and the regulated period starts the day the election is called. So this is important because you have to start preparing in advance. There's no grace period. So uh, an election could be triggered at any time. We won't get advance warning necessarily about when it will be triggered. And you've got to be ready to go if you're going to be engaging in regulated activities. So now we'll, we'll jump into uh, the first category, which is election surveys. And uh, so election surveys, and what I mean by election surveys is polls, essentially public opinion polls. They're only regulated in certain situations. And there's a two part test. It's uh, the first part is what is the poll about? And the second part is what are you using the poll for? So if your organization conducts a survey or a poll uh, about a political party, a candidate, or issues associated with a party or candidate. It might be their voting intention, for example. It might be their opinion on climate change regulations, on the carbon levy and rebate program, whatever you're, you're polling on. The fact that you conducted a poll is not enough for that poll to be regulated. You have to then use that poll to inform or develop or strategize uh, for other regulated activities. So if you take that poll, and you then use it to craft some of the messages that Sapria was talking about earlier, and you use it to target certain people because you know certain people are more sympathetic to your message, are more likely to respond, then that poll has become regulated. So you have to meet the first test, it has to be about one of those topics, and then you have to use it for election advertising, partisan activities, those regulated activities. We'll switch now to the, the next category which is election advertising. And election advertising has been in the Canada Elections Act. It's been regulated for third parties for a long period of time. This is not new. Uh, in order to qualify as election advertising, you have to meet two tests. So the first is you have to have a placement cost. And by placement cost, I mean you have to pay to distribute your message to the public. So I'll give you a few examples. You purchase a billboard. You purchase um, an advertisement on the side of a bus. The placement cost is the cost to purchase the billboard or the cost for uh, the advertisement on the bus. If you use Canada Post to send mailers to someone, the placement cost is the postage, the cost of the postage. Social media, again, we'll talk about this a little bit later. If you pay to boost or sponsor uh, content, so not free social media, but you're paying to, to, to do some of the analytics and the advertising that Sapria was talking about earlier on social media, the placement cost is the cost you paid to Facebook or you paid to Twitter <clears throat> to have your content pushed to the front of the line. So those are just some examples of placement costs. The second uh, element, so in order to qualify as election advertising, you also have to be uh, promoting or opposing the election of a party or candidate, or, so this is an or, or promoting or opposing an issue that is associated with a candidate. So I wanna delve into that a little bit more on the next slide. So what does it mean to promote or oppose a political party or candidate? So the, the, the um, language in the legislation is promote or oppose. We then have guidance from Elections Canada on what that means and Elections Canada has interpreted it very broadly. So they've said if you name a party or candidate in advertising, if you identify that party, for example, by using its logo or you identify the candidate by showing a photo or a cartoon of them, that is sufficient. Okay, so it's they've interpreted this very broadly. They've interpreted essentially the term promoter opposed to being identifying a party or candidate in, um, uh, in advertising. The last point I just wanna point out on the bottom here, and this is sometimes a little bit of a compliance risk, it's important to keep in mind that if you advertise a link to something that is otherwise regulated, that doesn't get you out of the rules. So if you were to purchase a billboard on the side of the bus that says, go visit www. whatever your website is, um, and then all your regulated activities are on that website, you can't get out of the regulations just by only advertising the website and the link. The act treats it the same as if you had actually purchased 
your advertisement on the side of the bus. Switching to the next slide. Um, what is an issue that's associated with a party or candidate? Again, Elections Canada has interpreted this very broadly. Essentially, any issue that is being talked about in a campaign is covered. So you look to a politician's social media, you look to the politician's speeches, debates, local candidates' forums, all of those things. Anything they're talking about um, is considered an issue associated with a candidate. Next slide. Uh, this might, uh, you might be thinking now, okay, so I'm a not-for-profit organization. I'm involved in talking about an issue that right now is not a priority. It's not being talked about. Uh, I haven't heard any politicians speak about it. What if in the middle of the election campaign, a uh, politician starts speaking about my issue? Does that mean all my advertising now is regulated? And from the date the issue becomes associated, so from the date the politician starts speaking about your issue, it is, it is regulated. Um, it doesn't retroactively apply. So if uh, the election was called on May 20th, the issue only started being talked about on May 25th, you don't have to uh, retroactively register for May 20 to May 25. And the last uh, <clears throat> group of regulated activities, so the first one was election surveys, the second one was advertising, and again, advertising had to have a placement cost. Um, partisan activities do not have to have a placement cost. <clears throat> Um, partisan activities, this is a broad category that was added to the legislation to capture activities that don't have placement costs. And it's any event or activity that promotes or opposes a party or candidate. So unlike advertising, this does not cover issue-based content. You have to be promoting or opposing the election of um, a party or candidate for this to apply. So on the next slide, there's a few examples. Uh, so <clears throat> telephone calls, emails, uh, free organic social media, so such as sending out a tweet. Again, you're not paying to boost it, for example. Holding rallies or events, we probably won't be doing that in the next federal election. But uh, if you were to have a virtual event, for example, door-to-door -door canvassing. So these sorts of things that don't have placement costs, they could be partisan activities. But again, they're only regulated if w the phone calls you're making or the door knocking or whatever is, is being done to promote or oppose a party or a candidate. So this, this category does not capture uh, solely issue-based content. So I'm going to walk through four examples now in social media. Uh, I'm going to just, I have an example, I'm going to talk about then is it regulated and if it's regulated, does it is it classified as election advertising or is it classified as partisan activity? So we'll start with the first example here. Um, <clears throat> So you have, uh, a, a, your organization has a Twitter account and you send out a tweet about uh, climate change regulations, okay? Uh, you don't pay to boost or advertise the tweet. So this is a free tweet that was sent out and there's no links to any other websites in the tweet. The question is, is this tweet about climate change regulations regulated? And the answer is no, okay? It's not advertising because it doesn't have a placement cost. And it's not a partisan activity because it was solely issued ba issues based. So it didn't promote or oppose the election of a candidate or a political party. Second example, though, let's take the same example. You send out the tweet, but this time you pay Twitter to boost it. So you want this tweet to appear in people's feeds. So you pay the company and they pop it up. OK, so it appears in people's feeds. Is it regulated? And the answer is yes. What type of regulated activity is it? It's election advertising, and why? Because it is issue-based and it has a placement cost. Third example, let's say, again on Twitter, you send out a tweet, you're not a big fan of a certain political party, you say, we gotta defeat this political party. Okay? And then again, you pay Twitter to uh, boost it. You want people to see this tweet. Uh, the question is, is it regulated? The answer is yes, absolutely. What type is it? It's advertising, okay? It's advertising because again, you paid to boost it, you have a placement cost, and it was promoting or opposing um, a political party or candidate. Final example here is the new catch-all category. Same scenario, but you don't pay to boost it. So you put out a tweet from your organization's account criticizing a political party, okay? It's time for change in Ottawa. We gotta defeat the government, uh, you know, whatever your, your message is, you don't pay. So this is free, this is organic, this is the new category, and this is regulated. 
okay? This is regulated, but it's a partisan activity. So it doesn't have a placement cost, but it does promote or oppose the election of a party or candidate. So that's the fourth category there. Um, I, I w I'm gonna skip through this section pretty quickly. Um, these are the rules around raising and spending funds. Um, again, if you're going to engage in regulated activities, it's important that you uh, start to plan these things in advance because the rules are a bit complex. Um, <clears throat> so on the next slide, um, some jurisdictions prohibit organizations from using their own funds. Uh, so funds that you collect from fees or membership dues or, or that you generate uh, from business or whatever your organization is involved in. Uh, that's not the case federally. You can use your organization's funds to engage in third party activities. However, they must be deposited in a separate bank account. And while there's no limit on the amount of money you can transfer into that bank account, there is a limit on the amount you can spend out of that bank account. So it wouldn't make much sense to put more money in there than you can spend. Um, there's two types of contributions or two types of ways you can raise money. One is monetary contributions, that's cash, checks, those sorts of things, and non-monetary contributions, which is uh, sometimes referred to as in-kind contributions. That's when someone donates property or service or labor, or they provide that property, service, or labor at a below market value. Um, <clears throat> You'll, if you're going to engage in fundraising, um, it's important to remember that you cannot accept uh, donations from what the Act calls foreign sources. Uh, that includes individuals who are not citizens or permanent residents of Canada. It also includes uh, foreign corporations, foreign not-for-profit organizations, and there's a very complex test to determine whether a specific corporation or not-for-profit is um, foreign. Also, please keep in mind, if you do accept donations, anyone who donates over $200, uh, their name will appear publicly in um, the elections registry as having made a donation to your third party. Uh, we talked about the foreign person one, so we can skip that. Uh, this again is the spending limits. Um, as as um, Liz noted earlier, uh, there's both a federal and a riding level expense limit at, uh, at the uh, federal level, same as in the province of Ontario. This I'll skip through very quickly too. Again, I'm happy to follow up after. Um, you're required to register if you incur $500 or more in expenses. Um, and that includes a whole host of things, uh, including overhead. So if you're using, if you're an existing organization that does things outside of an election, uh, you provide a service to, uh, to to a community, you are involved in environmental advocacy, whatever you're involved in. Um, it's important to remember you have to overhead costs. So the cost of rent, the cost of insurance, the cost of all those things that you, you need to account for that as well. That is considered an expense. Uh, again, very complex. This is a very simplified uh, view of the steps you need to take. The first thing you need to do though is you have to pass a board resolution uh, authorizing you to engage in regulated activities. You have to open up a separate bank account as I mentioned. There's a requirement to appoint a financial agent, $500 or more in expenses are incurred or $500 or more in donations are accepted. Auditor for $10,000 or more and then there's a bunch of reports that need to be filed. Uh, there's also labeling requirements on the next slide. Uh, so when you do engage in election advertising, you'll sometimes see this on uh, those of you that watch uh, television. I'm still, <laughs> I know Supriya was saying a lot of people don't watch anymore. I still watch it obsessively. Uh, you'll see ads on television, you know, tell your congresswoman to vote X, Y, or Z. Tell your member of parliament to vote X, Y, or Z. And there's always a tagline at the bottom. This this ad was authorized by so-and-so. And so there are requirements around that. So again, if you do step into the arena, uh, please keep in mind that you do have to label your content and you have to provide a link back to the organization that's responsible for um, authorizing the content. Um, I'm going to skip through this section very quickly. Uh, there are collusion provisions which you need to be aware of. Um, the Elections Act prohibits two third parties from colluding together 
and it also prevents a third party from colluding with a political party or colluding with a candidate. All right, so if you engage in regulated activities, you have to set up some kind of ethical walls, some kind of process by which your strategy, your advertising, it isn't being leaked to a political party, it isn't being shared with a political party, and you can't team up. So if there were three or four organizations on the call, you all cared about, let's say, homelessness, for example, you can't form a coalition and have four entities um, engage in that. You have to do your own activities. Um, if you do form a coalition, uh, it's, it's seen as collusion, and collectively, you could only spend the equivalent of one third party's uh, monetary value. So you could not spend 500,000, 500,000, 500,000, 500,000. You'd only be able to spend 500,000 collectively. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll just skip this slide for now, but I'm happy to follow up with this after. And so the last point I just want to make before uh, we open it up to questions is just talk a little bit about enforcement. Uh, so the Commissioner of Canada Elections, which is technically distinct from Elections Canada, is the uh, individual uh, who enforces the elections rules. And they have a wide variety of powers. Uh, they can proceed by way of a court-based process, which you will know as a prosecution or a criminal offence. Uh, they could also proceed by way of an administrative proceeding, which is where they do all of the investigating themselves. They essentially act as the police, the judge, the jury, all of that. Penalties are lower for administrative proceedings than for court-based proceedings. And in the administrative process, the Commissioner of Canada Elections has a wide variety of powers. So they can, for example, um, they can force you, but they can encourage you to enter into a compliance agreement or an undertaking. Um, essentially, what that is, is, is they're agreeing not to prosecute you or fine you uh, in exchange for you admitting wrongdoing. So if you go on the Elections Canada website, you'll see there's a whole host of entities. Uh, the commissioner only usually does this in non-egregious situations. Um, speeds up the administration of justice, but you would have to publicly admit that you had violated the Canada Election Act. There's administrative monetary penalties, um, which are a couple thousand dollars usually in the administrative process. And then of course, there's the final two bullets, which are the court-based process where they could seek an injunction, for example, to stop you from doing uh, something or to require you to register. And uh, there's also criminal prosecution, which on the next slide, so the maximum penalty, uh, again, this only applies to the court-based process, uh, but the maximum penalty is a fine of $100,000 and or uh, imprisonment of a term of up to five years. We do these presentations all the time on, on public sector ethics laws, lobbying laws, conflict of interest laws. Question always comes up, has anyone ever went to jail uh, for violating this act? And the answer in the Elections Act is, is absolutely, people have went to jail. The courts are very aggressive. So if you reach the stage where you're at a prosecution, again, this would most likely arise in a case where there was fraud, um, where there was an egregious breach, where there was you know, dramatic overspending of the limits, collusion, those sorts of things. Uh, but the whole purpose of setting up a compliance plan, preparing in advance of an election, is to prevent this worst case scenario from happening. And the final point I wanna make is, uh, those of you that follow politics, you'll be familiar with the uh, Del Mastro case a former member of parliament who was prosecuted on the political party side for overspending and for essentially through creative accounting, hiding his expenses from Elections Canada. And there's interesting commentary in that court case, which was upheld by the Court of Appeal in Ontario, where the financial agent was actually found to have been guilty of committing an offence on the standard of willful blindness. And what does that mean? Well, while Mr. Del Mastro, the court found, knew about the cover-up and, and the illegitimate expenses, the campaign agent or the financial agent was not aware. They could not prove that he subjectively knew. But what the court said is that he turned a blind eye. So there were a bunch of red flags and he should have investigated. So it's not sufficient if you think your organization has inadvertently engaged in regulated activities, for example, it's not sufficient for you to just you know, plug your ears, close your eyes and say, okay, I don't wanna investigate anymore. That's what willful blindness means. 
And the courts in these criminal cases will input the knowledge. They'll input the knowledge. So even though you might not have known about the violation, uh, the courts will say, you should have investigated. There were red flags. And so we're going to pretend that you did actually know. And uh, again, I'm happy. I, it's always a pleasure speaking to uh, uh, speaking to you, and I'm happy to follow up. Uh, if you do have any other questions, feel free to uh, to reach out. My email and phone number are there, or as well, we can connect on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter or anything like that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, that was very informative, and I think will be very helpful. I can already see the questions piling in, which is great. Um, so. Uh, we are going to move into our question and answer period. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the question box right now. Um, we're going to start with a couple questions that we have for Sapriya, and then we will um, ask Kyle questions afterwards. We're going to split it up a little bit differently today. Um, so Sapriya, I wanted to ask you, um, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that people are really starting to hit a wall. And so one of the questions we had from the audience was, do you think the fact that people are hitting a wall should change or impact the way um, we do our campaigning? For example, should it change maybe the frequency of messaging that we would traditionally do or the type of messaging we've put out altogether? So I think you want to be cognizant of um, directly bugging folks versus paid media, right? So there's a difference between, I think like social media posts and, and some of the paid ads that you would do would be more or less the same because people would see them virtually on their own time, right? As they're scrolling through Instagram or as they're logging onto Facebook or Twitter. But I think that's really where the email campaigning, you would have to be mindful a little bit of what the news cycle was that day. Like for example, if you were putting out a, uh, a, a starting a new email campaign, the day that the province announced locking down playgrounds, there would have been very few people paying attention to the email that you would have sent just because of the news cycle and just because of what was going on. So I, I, I don't think that's necessarily a blanket rule, but if you're trying to get people's one-on-one -on -one attention, that would matter. That's very helpful to know, thank you. Um, a second question we had was that you had mentioned the difference in social media channels. And so a question we have from the audience was, we were wondering if you think that there are certain plat platforms that should be prioritized by nonprofits when doing election campaigns. If someone, let's say, has a limited budget, how do they need to determine where they put their capacity for social media? So I think I think, and this may be an unsatisfactory answer, but if let's say you're trying to target Gen Z or, or millennials, um, I would say you would be going to a platform more along the lines of like an Instagram or a TikTok versus a Facebook. But Facebook still does have the general broadest overall reach. Um, and so I think generally the answer would be Facebook because of that and because the uh, advertising platform is very user friendly and very easy to use. However, it, if you're looking for a younger demographic, that's the only caveat that I would use because it does tend to skew a little bit older. That's true. We actually have a follow up question to that. Yeah. Um, uh, so speaking of social media and the importance of digital campaigns that you stress, given that a lot of nonprofits and charities um, leverage volunteers to run advocacy campaigns or to advance their efforts, do you have any suggestions for mobilizing volunteers to really engage in social media platforms as a part of your organization's campaign? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the best way to sort of get around what a lot of what Kyle was talking about in terms of paid campaigning, right? If you're getting volunteers to go out and tweet and post and whatever else for you, um, that's all fair game. You're not paying for that. So that, 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 that's okay to do. And I think a good way to do that is basically apply some of the core uh, messages that I was trying to get out there in the presentation, like facts matter, but the emotions matter more. You're doing that, but on steroids for your volunteers, uh, more or less, because you want to get them to care about the issue to the point where they are then giving up their own free time to try and um, you know shape your message for you. Perfect. Thank you. And I just have one final question. We'll do one more and 
For anyone who's submitting questions, any questions we're not able to get to, don't worry, we're also going to be sending up a follow-up package that will have resources as well. And so the last question um, I wanted to ask was um, about what you just spoke to, which is about the emotions mattering more. And so one of the things you, mess it, you, you mentioned in your presentation was that emails are a really great way for campaigns to get people on board. In terms of being able to demonstrate emotions through emails, do you think it's more impactful to do storytelling, to do videos um, that you could share through email, or do you think a combination works best for nonprofits depending on what their issue is? I think it's likely issue dependent, but one thing I would say about video is that I would be very reticent to use that over an email platform. I think people would look onto their uh, inbox and go, oh, I have to click on that instead of just like scrolling through a message. So right away, I think the engagement would likely drop. Um, but you know, that said, if it's something that can only be communicated through video or is best communicated through video, then you know you don't necessarily want to want to stray from that. Um, my own view would be if you are uh, trying to get something out there is your via email is to basically apply the rules that I had said in, in for a press release where you have you know the basic structure and more or less following that with respect to your email campaign. So you want the TLDR version right up front. You're going to want to tie it back to an emotional or, you know, I mean, a factual connection, but really appealing to somebody's emotion. And then you're giving them, um, you know, more, more facts or more context and then an action at the end. So what is it that you're asking them to do? Are you asking them to donate? Are you asking them to sign up? Are you asking them to tell, you know, to tweet or to tell somebody else about it? Um, and so you want to have those basic components in your email. Great, thank you. And I know that you have to jump off a little early. So I just before um, you jump off, I did want to say thank you so much for dedicating your time and your expertise to ONN today. We really appreciate it. And your slides and your information have been in uh, incredibly helpful. And my pleasure. Um, thank you everyone for having me and uh, my apologies for having to jump off a little bit early, but you're in good hands here with, uh, with Kyle and Melody. Thank you. Thank you. And Kyle, I have a couple questions for you now. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. So the first question we had is regarding paid advertising. So if a nonprofit or an organization gets a Google grant or let's say a Facebook grant um, where they get to have free advertising, so for example, they get a $10,000 Google grant that they can use on ads and they use it to promote an issue, would that be considered paid advertising because they technically got the money as a grant as opposed to paying Google themselves? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, so let's assume you're in an election period it, and I'm going to I'm going to answer, but I'm going to slightly dodge the question. It really depends on whether it is actually a grant that was given with no strings attached. Um, the same as someone might make a, a charitable contribution, someone might donate to your nonprofit, or if it was an in-kind contribution. So there is a risk in that scenario that if um, uh, one of the social media companies gives you uh, $10,000 in free advertising, that that will be construed as an in-kind contribution. So normally the fair market value of that would be $10,000. You're essentially getting a $10,000 donation from um, uh, the social media company, which you would potentially need to disclose on your registration. There might be restrictions, and I, I will clarify this, in your funding agreement. So you would need to go look at your funding agreement, whatever company had, had given you the grant to make sure that the, the the criteria in that agreement don't prohibit you from actually using it for election purposes. So I have seen in some grants before uh, from private sector entities that kind of language. So the answer is yes, it could potentially be regulated. You'd want to go look at the specific language, see what the strings are attached to it. As well, you'll want to um, you'll want to make sure that the contra the contract with the or the grant, the funding contribution agreement, does not uh, prohibit you from 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 using it for political purposes. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. And I think that'll be very relevant to a lot of nonprofits who do receive either the Google grant or other grants that are very similar um, for social media. Um, kind of pivoting a bit, we had a question about the provisions in the provincial and federal election acts. Are they completely distinct 
and only applicable to their respective election processes, um, or do they overlap? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, so there's a couple issues here. Actually, we um, Elections Canada did a consultation process uh, a few months ago. Actually, it might have been a little over a year ago on these rules. One of the issues that came up is the overlap between provincial regimes and the federal regime. So let me give you an example. Let's take something like Pharmacare. Let's say there's an Ontario election in the fall and there's a federal election in the spring or in the summer. Pharmacare could be an issue that is both provincial jurisdiction and it's also federal jurisdiction. So there is a potential that by engaging in advertising on something like Pharmacare, that it might be regulated under both the provincial regime and the federal regime. So Elections Canada has not issued guidance that says a provincial issue is exempt from the federal regime and the provincial regulator has not said the same thing. So it's certainly something you'd need to be aware of. Uh, the rules are not identical. Um, I assume most people in the uh, uh, on the call are operating in Ontario, but each province has different rules and those rules do differ from the federal um, uh, the federal standard as well. So partisan activities, for example, is very unique to the federal regime. Um, but e e the answer to your question is yes, there's a potential that uh, advertising on a specific issue could could capture that. And there's actually an interesting compliance agreement where the uh, Jason Kenney's Conservative Party in Alberta uh, distributed uh, bumper stickers um, uh, opposing uh, the Prime Minister in the last election. And they uh, signed a compliance agreement and they admitted that they had uh, violated the act. And that provincial party was found not to be exempt from the rules. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, th there is interplay. And um, if you're going to engage in that, you should certainly set up a compliance plan. And I would suspect that we would be heading to a provincial election shortly after a federal election. Thank you. That, um, that is very helpful. I'm just going through, um, we have a couple more questions and, um, and then we'll wrap up. So this one, it's, um, it's kind of one question. There's a couple that are related, so I'm going to see if I can group them together into one. Um, so at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about if you're promoting or you're opposing an issue. Um, so the question is about if your nonprofit mission promotes an issue that happens to be affiliated with one party, will it need to be regulated as a partisan activity? So that's kind of part one. If it's always been a part of your mission as opposed to this is something you're speaking about during the election itself. So if we took, for example, climate change, if you're an environmental organization that advocates and works towards um, you know, uh, advocacy efforts related to climate change, would that be considered a partisan activity? And then the second part to that would be, in the case of it, if it was, when we think about emails and social media and determining overhead costs, how would you determine overhead costs for something that is, you know, completely related to your whole mission as opposed to something that maybe you're dedicating 5% or 10% of the time during an election campaign? Okay, 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 perfect. So I'm going to divide this up and I wrote the question down here. So so let's take the scenario, uh, you are not for profit and you are communicating about climate change. And this was something that was in the news media in the last federal election. And there was a lot of confusion, uh, which was partially because the Globe published an article that they weren't entirely clear on the law. But so you're an organization, your day job is to promote climate action. That's what you do all day long. You do it whether you're in an election or not some of your activities will become regulated okay and the activities that will become regulated are activities that have a paid placement cost so let me give you an example let's say you're running right now we're not in an election you're running advertisements on facebook you're running advertisements on tv you've got billboards and banners on the side of buses encouraging climate action okay that's not regulated until we get into an election at the federal level um but the moment the election is called, climate change is an issue that all of the political parties have an opinion on, or they have a policy on, or well, some of them don't. But um, the moment the election is called, that paid advertising, okay, those 
activities with placement costs that only talk about climate change, those are regulated. Okay, so your option would then be to immediately stop paying. So cancel your ad buys on Facebook, cancel your television ads, cancel your bosses, take down your billboards, or to register as a third party. Okay, so that's the first step. Now let's go into, again, back to our scenario, you are a not-for-profit that you're, you're advocating for climate action. Let's say you're engaged now in things that don't have a paid placement cost. So you post for free on Facebook, you post for free on Twitter. You don't pay to boost these things, you're just posting. You can continue to do that for as long as you want and as often as you want, as long as you don't tie it to a party or candidate. So you'd be fine to send out a free tweet saying, you know, uh, we need to do more about climate change. Uh, we need to do this. We need to reduce emissions by this amount, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what you couldn't do, though, is say, you know, the liberal plan does not go far enough. The conservatives don't have a plan, uh, you know, whatever, they, because now you've stepped into that partisan activities category. But you can continue to talk about climate change as long as you don't incur placement costs. Um, so I hope that answers the first question. Um, the second part of the question is accounting on overhead. So, and, and I'm not an accountant. And uh, so if you do engage in more than 10,000, uh, your expenses are more than 10,000, you obviously have to hire an auditor and you, you have to be have an accountant involved in this. But the way overhead works is because labor costs are included. So we're not talking about volunteers. We're talking about you're a not-for-profit, you are paid a salary, uh, we're in an election period now and you are sitting at your desk designing an advertisement that's going to go on TV. Your labor costs gets included. And so the amount of time that you spend, you might spend two hours working on the election ad and you might spend the remaining six hours doing other day-to-day -day business. An equivalent to your salary for that two hours is a uh, in, essentially an in-kind contribution from the organization to the third parties. So the same thing works with overhead. So what most accountants, again, I'm not an accountant, but what most accountants will tell you is if you spend 20% of your time uh, uh, working on election advertising, working on regulated activities, and the other 80% of your time is spent doing things unrelated to the election, running your organization, uh, hiring people, do, whatever you're doing, then you would take 20% of your uh, insurance costs, your rent, all of those things, and you would allocate the overhead for that. So it would be essentially equivalent to your salary. What percentage of your time are you spending on the regulated activity? What percentage of the overhead are you spending on the regulated activity? So the, the easiest thing to do, what we advise clients, is to come up with like a little timesheet and... Uh, and um, uh, you know, you just track all your time, and you set like a pre a pre, a pre um, determined amount of overhead based on you. So it would depend on the number of people you have at your organization. Um, you know, all those sorts of things. Great, thank you. That was a, a complex question, so I, I appreciate you diving in and going through the details. Um, the last two questions we have um, are. A bit specific. So the first one is about given the pre-election period in Ontario is likely to start on May 5th, um, 2021. Would our federal election spending be caught by the provincial election rules? <laughs> um, okay, this is this is a bit of a complex area. I I think there's there's potentially a constitutional issue with some of this stuff. But again, if it's a if it's a clearly provincial issue. So um, I'm trying to think of, and the problem is, is with a lot of the issues you'll be dealing with, they won't be clearly provincial issues. But if it's a clearly provincial issue, like let's say you want to um, uh, paid six days, for example. So let's say your not-for-profit is um, concerned about paid sick days for provincial employees, or you're concerned about the minimum wage in Ontario. Okay, that's very clearly a provincial issue. I, I think it would be a stretch for Elections Canada uh, to say um, if there was a concurrent federal election or the pre-election period in Ontario overlapped with the federal election, that that somehow would be captured by the federal regime. But again, to go back to the case of the provincial party that was doing the bumper stickers, there's absolutely a risk. What I would advise you to do in that situation is to uh, try and get something in writing from Elections Canada. <clears throat> 
uh, telling you that they're not going to consider your provincial advertising to be captured under the federal regime and vice versa. There certainly is a, a risk, though, that it would be captured under both regimes. Now, would the double counting, I think that might be where you might get into a, a little bit of a constitutional issue in terms of if you couldn't, with concurrent elections, take something like climate change, which is, you know, a provincial and a federal issue. Um, it seemed to me it would be a bit unfair if the elections were going on at the same time that you would have to double count everything, count it under the provincial regime and count it under the federal regime. But there is there is a risk that that, um, that that could happen. Thank you. And our final question builds off of the previous one. Um, and someone has a specific situational question, so I'm not sure if you're able to answer this. Um, but they are saying, so we're running ads on affordable housing in a coalition, which is across the country. How do they get captured by Ontario's new third party rules in the 12 month pre-election period, which starts on May 5th? Yeah, so I, I'd want to check a couple things because uh, I'm not as familiar with, uh, I haven't followed uh, Bill 254 as, as closely as I should have. So I'd want to check a couple things, but one of the things you'd want to look into is um, how it would treat uncancelable expenses. Um, so because this is existing advertising and it's going on right now, so for example, Elections Canada, the federal level has said, um, let's take your example of the affordable housing thing, you're running a bunch of ads, uh, the government goes to the acting governor general tomorrow and calls an election, you can't take all these ads down. Um, they said in, if you take a reasonable amount of time to get everything in order and take those ads down, we're not gonna, we're not gonna worry about it. Uh, so I'm not sure how the provincial legislation I can I can check and get back to you, treats uncancelable expenses, um, but but assuming that uh, it does meet the definition of issue advertising, which I assume it would, um, then I I assume what you would do or what the accounting advice would be is to prorate the portion of the um, of the campaign that is based in Ontario. Uh, so if you're targeting these ads on social media or something or purchasing them through the television, you'd be able to tell what uh, percentage of your spend was based in Ontario. Obviously, you wouldn't be accounting for uh, under the Ontario regime advertising that was going on in other provinces like BC and uh, Alberta. Um, but it's again, this is this is where it's like these issues get very complex. And um, I would highly recommend reaching out to a lawyer or to the regulator, but be careful um, when you reach out to the regulator. Um, and uh, it, certainly reaching out to an accountant for the um, uh, the way that you could account for certain costs when only a portion of those costs are regulated. Thank you. I think that is a very helpful advice for um, those specific situational questions. So. As we wrap up, I just want to give you a big thank you, Kyle. Thank you for dedicating your time and your expertise and sharing your critical insights with us today and being a continuous supporter of ONN. We really, really appreciate your labor and time today. And also a big thank you to everyone who joined the call today. We hope um, that you were able to find insights for your future campaign efforts and also prepare for the elections that are coming up. We would love to stay connected with each of you today, whether it's connecting over social media, joining future webinars, or becoming an ONN member. We hope that you keep in touch and that you have a wonderful afternoon. Bye for now.